Type 3 secretion systems are also known as injectosomes. These are essentially needle-like protein appendages found on gram-negative bacteria. They facilitate delivery of toxins to the eukaryotic host cell. You'll find a really nice table that summarizes the main features of exo and endotoxins in the book, so I won't belabor all the points. But the main thing I want to emphasize is that endotoxin is composed of lipopolysaccharide, LPS, and that this is only found in gram-negative species. So here's our image of the gram-negative cell wall again, and you can see the LPS chains are attached to our outer membrane. If you recall from our earlier discussion on LPS, endotoxin, and shock, you'll see that it is a great way for them to test you on micro and pathology at the same time. Let's bring it home. Gram negatives have endotoxins composed of LPS. Your patient presents with the following signs and symptoms. Fever, tachycardia, and hypotension. Then you go and examine the patient. What does their skin feel like? Warm, warm and well perfused. They've got peripheral vasodilation from release of the chemotactic factors. They might ask you what kind of antibiotics you want to use, or they may even ask you to pick a bug. If you have no other clues, go for the gram-negative rod. Or, if you're picking antibiotics, make sure to select the agent that has good gram-negative coverage. Bam! Just got another question right. More on exotoxins on the next slide. Let's start with a bacteria whose exotoxin acts by inhibiting protein synthesis. Carinobacterium diphtheriae produces an exotoxin, which is known as the ADP ribosylating AB toxin. Now these toxins have two components. The B component, which facilitates the binding of the toxin to its target host cell, and the A component, which is the active subunit, and it attaches an ADP ribosyl group to the host protein, which effectively alters the protein's function. So the A subunit of Crinobacterium diphtheriae is going to attach an ADP ribosyl group to elongation factor 2 in the human cell, thereby stopping protein synthesis. This leads to the clinical presentation of diphtheria with gray pseudomembranous pharyngitis. Similarly, the exotoxin A of pseudomonas attaches an ADP ribosyl group to elongation factor of the host cell and thereby inactivates host protein synthesis, but in this case causing cell death. Shigella species also produce an exotoxin which inhibits protein synthesis. The Shiga toxin, Shiga toxin, the Shiga toxin functions by inactivating the 60S ribosome by physically removing an adenine group from the rRNA. Note that Shigella is an invasive bacteria, so it will penetrate the mucosa and cause cell death. Similar to Shigella, Enterohemorrhagic E. coli, or E. hec, produces shiga-like toxin. Shiga-like toxin. Note that E. hec is a non-invasive bug. Here's a nice opportunity to integrate with both heme and renal chapters of the book. Both shigella and E. coli O157H7 can cause HUS, or hemolytic uremic syndrome. They cause this by stimulating cytokine release. HUS is a very serious complication, particularly associated with enterohemorrhagic E. coli infections. Can you tell me what is the classic triad of HUS? I'm thinking of the following three things. Hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure. In the hematology section, you will learn about thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which is a related disorder. Okay, time for another flash quiz. Name two exotoxins that inhibit elongation factor 2. And can you tell me the mechanism? I hope that you're saying diphtheria toxin and pseudomonas exotoxin A. If not, don't worry, there is still time to commit these to memory. And the mechanism I'm looking for is ADP ribosylation of elongation factor 2. Nice work. Next, let's discuss toxins that increase fluid secretion. There are two bugs whose toxins work via the same mechanism. One is enterotoxigenic E. coli, or ETEC, and the other is Vibrio cholera. The heat 
labile toxin of ETEC and cholera toxin both activate stimulatory G protein that activates adenylyl cyclase. Recall from biochemistry that adenylyl cyclase increases cyclic AMP production. This increased cyclic AMP thereby increases chloride secretion into the intestinal lumen. Here's our cross-section of the intestinal lumen. Chloride is going to go into the lumen. Of course, water is going to follow, and this results in watery diarrhea. In the case of Vibrio cholera, the diarrhea is often referred to as rice water because it appears like water after you boil rice, murky and kind of whitish. Next time you boil rice, I want you to think about the explosive diarrhea associated with cholera. Sorry if I've just ruined rice for some of you out there, but you'll forgive me when you remember the buzzword on your test. The heat stable toxin of ETEC activates cyclic GMP production, not cyclic AMP like the heat labile form. This causes decreased sodium chloride resorption from the gut, and since water follows salt, it ultimately causes watery diarrhea. So in the same cross-section now, we have a decrease in salt and water reabsorption. So normally it would be following out this way, but this is blocked, resulting in increased water load in the intestine. So labile causes increased cyclic AMP, stable causes increased cyclic GMP. Label in the air, stable on the ground. This image shows a bacillus anthracis infection of the left eye. The bacillus anthracis toxin has two subunits, edema factor and lethal factor. In this image, the necrotic tissue that you can see is caused by lethal factor. You will also see some swelling around the eye which is caused by edema factor. Edema factor acts to increase cyclic AMP levels. This is similar to the cholera and E. coli labile toxins. However, this toxin is unique in that the toxin itself has enzymatic activity and can continuously produce cyclic AMP without having to be activated by a G protein. Bordetella pertussis also works by activating adenylyl cyclase to increase cyclic AMP. Instead of activating GS, as we discussed with Vibrio cholera, pertussis actually disables GI. GI normally regulates adenylyl cyclase activity, so the inhibition causes uncontrolled cyclic AMP production. The result is increased cyclic AMP, which inhibits phagocytosis and provides for the prolonged survival of Bordetella pertussis. So, what does the cough associated with Bordetella pertussis sound like? You may have heard of a whooping cough, and you're right. Let's quickly review which bacterial toxins affect cyclic AMP production. Which three toxins overactivate adenylyl cyclase? Two bacterial toxins permanently activate GS. Heat labile toxin of ETEC and cholera toxin of Vibrio cholera. Both of these activate GS and one toxin, the pertussis toxin, inhibits GI. Both of these cause increased cyclic AMP production. Now, which toxin mimics adenylyl cyclase activity? The answer, edema factor of bacillus anthracis. Next, we'll talk about bacteria whose exotoxins inhibit release of neurotransmitter. Clostridium tetany produces the tetanospasmin toxin. This toxin cleaves the snare protein complex required for neurotransmitter release. And what neurotransmitters are blocked from release? There are two of them, GABA and glycine. Are these inhibitory? or activating neurotransmitters. They are inhibitory, which is why their absence causes the spasms and tetany seen in tetanus. Without inhibition of motor impulses, unopposed muscle contraction and spasm can occur. Here is an example of the rigidity produced by tetanus toxin. This will be vastly different than the muscle tone you would see with the next toxin, which we will discuss. Of course, tetanus immunization is part of the Tdap series.
tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis. Similar to C. tetany, Clostridium botulinum toxin also blocks the release of a neurotransmitter. The mechanism is the same, actually. It cleaves the snare protein complex required for a transmitter release. In this case, however, it is the release of stimulatory acetylcholine from the presynaptic nerve terminals. So what are the key signs of botulinum toxicity? The key thing that you'll see is flaccid paralysis. In fact, if you get a vignette on your test, you're almost certain to read about a baby who is brought in by very concerned parents. You go to examine the baby, and what's the word that they're going to use? They're going to say the baby is floppy, a floppy baby. What does that mean? Well, by that I mean that they have absolutely no muscle tone. You're going to want to admit this baby to the hospital and help them breathe. Remember, the diaphragm is a muscle too, and if it gets paralyzed, you're in big trouble. Look for other anticholinergic signs, such as patients complaining of blurred or double vision, difficulty speaking or swallowing, ptosis or droopy eyelids, muscle weakness, or GI symptoms such as constipation. The paralytic effects generally progress in a descending fashion. Okay, time for another flash quiz. Hopefully you're getting the hang of these by now. What is the significance of tetanospasmin's interaction with the snare complex? Answer, decreased release of GABA and glycine. Since these are inhibitory neurotransmitter, you'll develop tetany in spasm. Now let's discuss toxins that lyse cell membranes. Clostridium perfringens produces alpha toxin, which is a lecithinase. Lecithin is a lipid found in the outer cell membranes of all human cells. The alpha toxin of C. perfringens can therefore necrotize tissue and destroy blood vessels by cleaving cellular membranes. As you can see in this image, the necrosis can be profound. Would there be any particular imaging findings? Let's say on an x-ray or a CT scan. This is a tough question, but remember that C. perfringens can cause gas gangrene, so you might see free air within the tissue on your imaging study. Strep pyogenes produces two exotoxins with different mechanisms. One exotoxin is known as streptolysin O, which is a hemolysin. This means that the toxin actually leads to red blood cell lysis. This turns out to be a powerful diagnostic tool, actually. When strep pyogenes is grown in blood, we will see complete lysis of the RBCs. Our body will make antibodies against streptolysin O antigen, known as anti-streptolysin antibodies, or ASO. In order to diagnose rheumatic fever, we often check serology for ASO antibodies. Please remember that although the hemolysins will lyse red cells in agar, which as I've mentioned helps with diagnosis, hemolysis does not occur in patients infected with beta hemolytic streptococci. And while we're on the topic, what are some of the key physical exam findings of rheumatic fever? You might be thinking of subcutaneous nodules, polyarthritis, or even a rash called erythema marginatum, carditis, and choreiform movements. Excellent integration there. You will learn more about rheumatic fever when you study cardiology. Staph aureus produces a super antigen known as toxic shock syndrome toxin 1, which as the name implies results in toxic shock. Strep pyogenes can also produce a super antigen known as exotoxin A. Superantigens are particularly dangerous because they can cause nonspecific interactions between MHC class 2 receptors and the T cell receptors. Recall from immunology that normally an antigenic peptide is required to have a specific interaction between the MHC class 2 molecule here and the T cell receptor here. However, superantigens cause nonspecific proliferation. Note the absence of any antigen in between the T cell receptor and the MHC class 2. This is a nonspecific interaction which causes proliferation of T and B cells and thus an overwhelming activation of the immune system. Now, here you're going to have release of inflammatory cytokines, interferon gamma and IL-2, which cause shock. So, what are the key findings in toxic shock syndrome? Fever, rash, and shock. You might see toxic shock syndrome appear on your test with a vignette describing a foreign object being placed in the body, commonly either a vaginal tampon or intranasal packing for epistaxis. 
The patient then develops fever and shock. You've just made your diagnosis. The LPS endotoxin consists of a polysaccharide chain and a lipid moiety, which is usually lipid A. Lipid A can activate the release of IL-1, which causes fever, as we discussed. It also causes TNF-alpha, which causes fever and hypotension, as well as nitric oxide, which causes the hypotension seen in septic shock. As we have discussed, this hypotension is due to massive vasodilatation caused by these inflammatory mediators. Lipid A can also activate the complement pathway with C3A, also causing hypotension, in addition to promoting edema. C5A is a powerful chemotactic agent and will attract neutrophils to the site of the infection. Finally, endotoxin is capable of activating tissue factor, which initiates a coagulation cascade and DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation. DIC will be fully covered in the hematology section, but for now, you should remember that it is a consumptive coagulopathy that occurs when the coagulation factors are consumed as small clots made throughout the body. The consumption of these coagulation factors and platelets then causes a total deficiency and thus leaves you unable to clot your blood. So what happens is that the patient will start oozing blood from everywhere. One final thought. Remember that Neisseria contains lipooligosaccharide, or LOS, a variant of gram-negative LPS endotoxin. It does not possess the O polysaccharide moiety in LPS, but still has cytotoxic capabilities like the LPS endotoxin. This has been known to show up on the boards, so just keep that in mind. Time for another flash quiz. This time, a young boy is admitted to the hospital with epistaxis. Nasal packing is placed in the ED. Six hours later, he develops fever, hypotension, and a rash. What is your diagnosis? The answer is toxic shock syndrome, likely from Staph aureus.